So this thing will do two hours continuous on like a charge and on the card. It's probably not, unless you know they're going to be stopping and starting for a long amount of time, it's probably not worth carefully stopping and starting, if that makes sense. Just let it roll. Well, let it roll. Yep. Roll. Okay. So my dad was really quite resourceful. He built up a uh, delivering uh, fresh rolls from the bakery to people who are homebound, and uh, then he got it branched out with butter. We I, we'd be weighing on a, on a little household scale quarter pound of butter. It was, if somebody wanted a half a pound, that was a lot. That's the way people bought things during the Depression. What uh, what weight would it come in? Well, he would buy a tub, a small tub of butter. As I recall, it was about a 10-pound uh, tub of butter. And uh, he knew somebody had a butter and egg. They had butter and egg stores in those days. Uh, something we don't, you don't see anymore. Butter and eggs and stuff like that. Anyway, he built that round up. And then it was getting too much for him or wasn't making it enough. Uh, I was, what, 10 years old, and uh, what did I know? I know, all I know is there was always food on the table to eat. And uh, then he went into the installment business, uh, knocking on doors or with recommendations, and he would sell uh, on an installment period house, household furnishings and clothing. If somebody wanted a suit, they would go to a, a place on Roosevelt Road near Halston Street and they would make a selection of all kinds of articles of clo clothing, furnishings, you name it. But he couldn't make a go of it because he would come to collect every week and, oh, Harry, I just don't have it th this week. And so he would let it pass. He would let it pass. Some guys did very well in the installment business, and uh, but he didn't. And somehow he got a job as a milkman, and he was given a route in the west side. The horse knew it better than he did. It, it was really an interesting uh, uh, thing because I would help him, uh, especially in the winter time. The uh, the uh, weather was very bad, and uh, it's going. They're trying to fix the lighting here. Tap it one more time, and you get a. It's got three speeds. That's it. Wonderful. And so he would. Uh, the horse would stop somewhere, and you. What the hell is the horse stopping for? He would look in the book, and there. It was a customer on the second or the third floor. I uh, r remember mostly one winter day. It was horrible. The weather it was a real sh snowstorm, and I my mother woke me up. Lester, you got to go help your father. It's the weather is terrible, and I went out and uh, we finished the route. Well, before before we finished the route. My dad was very sociable with some of the customers, and he said, we're going to go inside so-and-so, and we'll warm up. And sure enough, she invited us in. I had a cup of hot cocoa. It was a pleasure. And so he went, and uh, he stayed on the milk route job. Uh, he learned a lesson. The barn boss, his horse, the wagon was drawn by the horse, and one day he was late coming in, and the horse was really steaming, and the barn boss told him very clearly, he said, Harry, we can get guys like you a dime a dozen, but we have to buy these horses and feed, and feed them. We don't have to do that. We pay you, and you make your money, and you go. And just don't ever do this again. Don't abuse your horse. So and Harry he, would rent the horse? No, he wouldn't rent it. It was provided by the dairy. Oh, by the dairy. Okay. Yeah, by the man. dairy. Got it. And that brings me into another stage of our life with my dad. 
You know, my dad was a revolutionary. In 1905, the uh, Tsar gave him a vacation in, Siber in Siberia. Uh, he told me how he got there, but he never told me how he got out. Uh, how, how did he get there? He got there, they had a bunch of political prisoners on a train, and the train would chug along to a village out in the middle of nowhere and dump off a certain number of prisoners. And uh, they would uh, report to the police station and they'd take, they'd take your name, and then they would assign you to a house. You live with this family, you help them out, and the family would get a stipend from the government to take care, to feed and clothe these guys. Feed, mostly give them shelter and food. So it was basically house arrest, but in somebody else's house. In somebody else's house, and there's no, no where the hell are you going to go in, the, in this wilderness? It was really amazing. And so this is 1905? Well, it had to be, yeah, from the 1905 revolution. How old was he? How old was he? Oh, when was he born? I can't, I can't answer that. He was a young kid, a young guy. He was in his 20s. Oh, God, we're going to figure this out. I don't know how old he was. And so uh, that was his experience. And uh, he had already met my wife, his mother, his wife. He met my mother, his wife, Lottie. And uh, Lottie came from a whole different background. Uh, her parents had some kind of a retail. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying when he went to Si, when he was sent to Siberia in 1905, he had already known Lottie? Well, I think so. Maybe he met her when he got out. I'm not sure. Okay. That was a a leap in faith or something. Did, and, did they uh, not have any sort of registration? So he could, they, they dump him off in Siberia, but if he makes his way back, nobody knows. Yeah, that's right. And uh, how he got back, I don't know whether it was legal or illegal, but uh, a few years later, well, they came in, you know, he met my wife, I think that's a little more accurately, Leo. And uh, they hit it off, and she came from a very different background. Her parents were uh, small, petty uh, storekeepers, and uh, she was working somewhere, doing something I don't recall. What, what, I don't what recall did, what. What did his parents do? Pardon? What did his parents do? What did your grandparents do? His, my grandparents, he was orphaned at an early age. And he lived with one cousin and then another cousin, another family member or a friend, a very poor background. And uh, they wound up here in 1910, uh, landed in New York, of course. And uh, They came together? Pardon? All three of them or more? What three? Who, who came in 1910? Oh, Lottie and... My mother and father. They Lottie came and Harry. Here. Were they married in Russia? Or they just came here together? They, they came here. They were married here, I believe. I'm not even certain. Oh, and, those, those revolutionary free thinkers. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, he wound up through the grapevine or the Jewish agency in a piano factory, in a furniture, piano furniture factory in Indiana, and then in Sheboygan. Then he wound up in Chicago. And in where, Chico where did he learn to be a cabinet maker? In, in Russia? Pardon? Where did he learn to be a cabinet, cabinet maker? In, in Russia. In Russia. Yeah, in Russia. And uh, he, uh, he, he seemed to be doing pretty well. He had an interesting story. During World War I, my father was sort of a, he wasn't a, a boss gang. It was, you know, they worked in teams in constructing the piano. And he, uh, and for people that worked in factories like that, and a lot of those men did work on their own at, at home. And they would get their material from the, from the company, illegally, of course. And they were, whether it was screws or nails or glue, glue what have you, they would 
put it in your lunch bo box, your lunch bucket, and go home with it. Well, during World War I, they were rationing some of the material. So he came right out with the guy. He said, listen, you need whatever it is you need. You need some, some nails, some screws. Let me know. I'll get enough for, for you. And that way he was able to control the amount of stuff that they were taking. And so he stayed there until the Depression. Until the Depression. And he came... He came, uh, uh, well, let's see, after the Depression. Well, we talked about his working in, in being in the Stallman Theater. My mother was a housewife all of the time, and uh, she did not go out. I helped her with her citizenship papers, signing her name, how her little penmanship. And she took the test and she passed it. She became a citizen before my father. And Do you remember what year that was? Oh dear, that had to be, I must have been, oh, well I was still in grammar school. So that would be 1932, 33, somewhere's in there, somewhere's in there. Uh, and it was interesting. We lived on the west side, across of Herzl's school, Theodore Her Herzl. Uh, it had been a grammar school, a junior high school, a junior college, and I don't know what it is today. It was a public. It was a public school. Public school. It yeah. was a public school on the west side of Chicago, named after Herzl. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and actually, the neighborhood. You know, they talk about the Great West Side of Chicago, and that was a period of was where Jews were were in the, in the majority. Uh, we we they had displaced Bohemians from Czechoslovakia, and uh, it, it, in just a few blocks south of us. And now, when you say Bohemians, you mean yeah, actual Bohemians, yeah. not the not the New York Bohemians, yeah, not, not the New York, not Bohemians. the Beatnik Bohemians, exactly. Yes. And uh, there's an interesting story about the uh, uh, some of the Bohemians. There were a lot of Bohemians in the printing trade in Chicago, and one of the reasons is they lived west. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, just about into Berwyn and off of, uh, centered around 22nd Street, which was a streetcar line, which ended up in the east, just where the R.R. R. Donnelly plant was. And so people would hop on the streetcar and get a job at Donnelly's. And so that why, explains why they had so many Bohemians working, working there. There were a number of national groups in the printing trade, which we experienced in the typographical union. Well, that'll come later in this story. We can talk about, uh, uh, let's see, let's meet one of uh, David's. We'll take a look. What happened to that sheet, that little poop sheet? He, uh, uh, All right, so we're talking about parents and grandparents. What, uh, what are your fondest childhood memories? My fondest memories as a child, I guess, I guess they go back, some of them to the winter time, sledding down the embankment from the railroad tracks at Shed Park on Longdale Avenue, on Longdale Avenue, and uh, also a, a bitter one. I had an uncle who was later, he also was a cabinet maker, and uh, he had a rough time going uh, economically, and uh, at one point he left the west side, west side and tried to open up a little fix-it shop up in Albany Park, and that would be a good hour's ride on the streetcar from uh, the west side to Albany Park park, my mother would pack a bag of food and go take this to Uncle Louie. It was a, 
something you just never forget. And uh, life went on for our folks, uh, my folks. Uh, my father, after I got in the army, he felt that it wasn't right for him to be delivering milk. He should do something. Well, cousin Marv uh, was working at the torpedo plant, and he got him a job. And my father was willing to do anything. Anything. They couldn't do anything, and Marv felt bad. He said, "Well, Harry, and get a job with you sweeping the floor. The place has to be." Clean. Clean. He says, I'll do it. It's a job. I'm helping you guys make torpedoes. And it turned out that uh, Cousin Marvin was president of the steel workers lo local in the torpedo, torpedo plant. And my, da and my dad would deliver mess messages to, to the other workers that, that they couldn't get, get otherwise. And there was no policy numbers or anything like that that I... I knew about, but union stuff is what they peddled, and so it went on. Uh, now I think with them talking about the wartime, and uh, it's kind of interesting uh, that uh, when uh, when were you drafted? Well, that, well that's a good story. Uh, I was, Alice and I were married in 1940 a full year before Pearl Harbor. And uh, so I automatically got a, a classification as being married. And then I didn't hear from the draft board until 19, early 1943. And uh, so I had to appear before the draft board. And they were a bunch of jerks. Why did you get married? I looked at these men who were older than me. I said, what do you mean? Aren't you guys married? Why did you get married? I got married and fell in love with this woman. And so they said, oh, okay, you were married before Pearl Harbor. It was legitimate. And so they, you'll hear from my, oh, and I told them that at that time my wife was pregnant and that we were expecting the baby in May, April or May. And, uh, well, we'll see about that. And I went home, and then they didn't bother me, didn't tell me to report until September of 43. So I had a few months with the baby. We had given up our apartment, and... Uh, and that, that was Ron, right? That was Ron. That was uh, born in 1943, and uh, May 13th, I believe. And anyway, uh, we, we gave up our apartment. It was a, in the, on the west side in Garfield, just opposite Garfield, Garfield Park. And we uh, uh, gave that apartment up, put all our belongings in a pickup truck, and went to Alice's parents. Where'd you get, where'd you get the pickup truck? We, Got it from somebody I don't know. It was a who who can remember where where or how I got it. But we had a tr got a truck and we moved the stuff up to Albany Park. Park. That was an upgrade for me. Uh, Sam and Minnie, Alice's parents, were most hospitable. After all, it was their son-in-law, the big provider for her, their daughter, and they were very. Uh, what the. Uh... What work were you doing when you were drafted? You were a printer already? Was that enough? No, no, I was not a printer. I had gone from job to job, very uh, worked uh, in a variety of places wherever I could get the highest uh, value. And uh, Do you, doing what? Uh, what sort of things? What sort of thing? It wasn't one thing. I was. Uh, I worked in a foundry. And on Roosevelt, on Roosevelt Road, and uh, that was hard work. And then I worked somewhere else. I don't really, oh, I got to really, really stretch back into my data bank to tell you where I worked. Uh, 
Oh, I even put in a stint in the stockyards. That was an interesting... Uh, I got a job on the killing floor and got an education in how the Packers worked. Swift and Company, I think the, at that time, the largest uh, packing house in the country. And uh, the basic job on the killing floor was disassembling the carcass, the carcass of the animal. And alongside, so when they butchered the, uh, the cow or the lamb, whatever it was, they would put deposit the innards in a tray in a little conveyor and it would go down and be inspected by the uh, federal department of agriculture men and quite often they would take a break and when they took a break the boss of the operation would speed up the line and a lot more stuff would go uninspected it really was a jungle as Upton Sinclair put it. After a while, I worked there in that, on that floor for a while, and uh, the uh, foreman came up to me in a real paternally way, put his arm on my shoulder and said, you know, this work isn't cut out for you. you. I'll get you a job in another department where you won't have to work so hard. And so it, it was rough work. And uh, what, what did you do? Well, for a while I was cutting into the belly of the animal and butchering. I didn't do much butch butchering. It was mostly I would slit the animal and then it would move on to the next guy. And I'm, I'm so, missing something here with this foreman. Why is he being so good to you? I don't know. Well, maybe he heard me talking about Union. That was the time when the stock carries. <laughs> Maybe that was the time when the stockyards were being organized by the packing house workers. It wasn't the union job when you took the job, it was not unionized? No, no. Oh, no. so maybe, maybe yeah. There was no contract yet. Uh, well, there may have been, I don't know, I really, I really didn't know. I didn't, I didn't have any much contact. I didn't have very much contact with the union at that time. Anyway, I got a nice job. It was about a mile west, almost at Western Avenue, a, a rail yard where people would have to clean out the cars. And the, the freight cars, there would be salt. Salt had to be shoveled out. And uh, all kinds of junk and paper wrapping. And we would uh, clean out the cars. And uh, it was outdoor work, but it was nice. It was a good time of the year. And, uh, and that was easier than working on the line? Yeah, you know, a hell of a lot easier, and I think it was a, a couple of pennies more, more pay. The um, interesting thing there, working with the Mexican workers, they couldn't believe that I was Jewish and working with my hands, laboring. Yeah, come on, you belong in a bank. I said, well, Jews are like everybody else. There's some rich ones and there are poor ones. And that's where I belong, and uh, it was good. I that was my first introduction to uh, Mexican food. One guy, that was his job to provide the uh, enchiladas and burritos for us, and he, they were freshly made, and we would have our lunch there and uh, find a comfortable spot, and. Uh, I worked, as I say, in a foundry and, and at the stockyards, somewhere, somewhere else. And in September, I was called into the army. And, uh, and, and I should say, parents, that before I went into the army, when there was quite a discussion between Lester and Alice about having a a kid. She insisted, I'm going to the army, she wants to have a baby for me. A and second, I said a no. And she really he's didn't. just jumped back to 42 yeah. when he knows he's going to get, he's like, it becomes increasingly after, after um, Pearl Harbor, it becomes increasingly likely that whether you're married or a father or anything else, you're going to get drafted. See, they, they, they had a classification system. Single men, Married men, 
married with children, uh, and I think the age limit was 30, 38, something like that. So I was a, I don't remember what the official number was, but I was listed as married and then with a kid. So they gave me that deferment, and it was September of uh, 43 that uh, I went into the Army, went into Camp Grant. So how did, how did that process go? Where did you report? Where did I report? Yeah. Well, I reported to the, uh, ooh, they had a reception center. A reduction um, center. Yeah. Uh, I, I had to report downtown to one of the large office buildings where they were interviewed and they said, you go here, you go there. And uh, so I went into, uh, I was classified, uh, well, didn't get a classification until later, got into the uh, infantry. And uh, so, where and you said you went to Camp Grant. Where was Camp? For, for Camp Grant was just outside of Rock, Rockford, and uh, it was Rockford. just a reception center, to, you know, sort of a holding place until they decided where the troops, the men would go. And I wound up going to uh, Alabama Fort uh, Rucker. No, damn it, McClellan. Camp Fort McClellan, a son of a bitch of a commander who gave Lincoln a hard time during the Civil War. He uh, always enjoyed staying way back, didn't want to get too close to the front line. Anyway, uh, living there with in the barracks, we had a group of men from Chicago, from Chicago a group of men from uh, Detroit and surrounding areas. One of the notable, we, I was living in a small barracks. We had about, uh, mm, a platoon, we had a platoon. Uh, I don't know, how many, who remembers? How many men were in a platoon? About 48. And uh, so we lived in these barracks. It was interesting. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, a memorable event. We had one holdover. It was, this was a 13, 17 week cycle of basic training. And there were a couple of guys that didn't make it. They didn't know what to do with them because they were illiterate. They weren't dumb, but they didn't know how to read and write very well. Well, the Army finally established a school, but until he went to, to learn how to read and write, we, he would live with us. And uh, at mail call he would get a le letter and somebody would read the letter out loud. Well, I felt embarrassed for the guy. This, this soldier was reading the letter and Sizemore was his name and his girlfriend was oh Sizemore I miss you and she would go on to tell him about she was at a dance and uh, he she was dancing with so and so and he was rubbing rubbing me up and I was thinking of you all the time well some of these guys would just bur burst into laughter into laughter into laughter can't say. And they would laugh and make poke fun at him. And they were supposed to be literate people. Well, this is, this is how it goes. Well, you no, know, I had my military service. You, the, want, uh, you want a drink of water? Yeah, okay, we'll take a break. I got, I got some. Don't you shut it off? Nah. Huh. We'll, we'll edit it all out later. It's fine. Oh, thank you. Leo to the rescue. Oh, I'm the I'm the rescuer instead of the protector. Well, New title, huh? Well, you're both. 
the uh, <laughs> some interesting experiences in the army. Well, let's, in what's, basic, what's, what's, so okay in basic training. Basic training. Uh, <clears throat> there was uh, one of the things we did was uh, go on big long marches at night. I remember writing a letter home. And by the light of the moon, it was such a clear night. And there was one fellow who had trouble on the obstacle course. And before getting to the obstacle course, we would have to jump over a big ditch. And nobody had trouble jumping over this thing. We'd run and jump over it, except one, one man. And he just couldn't do it. And so he, uh, I don't know, they sent him somewhere. Uh, whatever happened to him, I don't know. And anyway, I came out of basic training as a machine gunner with a uh, sidearm, a 45 pit revolver, and uh, that's what I went overseas. Was that uh, the, the M2, the, the Browning? Pardon? The Browning or the... No, the pistol. No, the machine gun that you were The machine for. gun was a... Uh, Fragmer Gringer, gosh, ask me another, an easier okay. question, I don't know. It was a machine gun, and I was a machine gunner for a very short time. We, uh, <clears throat> we were in England before we shipped over to France about when did roughly you... about two weeks after D after D day. So hold on a second, let's back up. So you, you do like thirteen or seventeen weeks of basic training in Alabama. Yeah. Did I what? It, you did basic training in Alabama. Yeah, right. And that was about three months, two months, or four seventeen well, weeks. It was you a said? seventeen week period. Uh, was there secondary training? No, no, no. You second. went straight from Alabama to England. From Alabama, I went overseas. Okay. But before that, I had uh, Alice intervened. My mother had a very serious stroke, and uh, I got an emergency furlough to go home and see my mother. She pulled through, but she was damaged. She died at an early age. And uh, she died in 19, da -da -da -da, whatever, 49, oh, 49. But Alice was able to get the uh, emergency furlough. How, how long was the furlough? And it was about two weeks. And when I came back, reported back to uh, Fort McClellan, my, out my outfit had shipped to the Pacific. And then I hung around for a while. Do you know where they ended up in the Pacific? No, I don't know. I lost all contact with them. And uh, what I did learn is that the permanent cadre of the Army ate differently than the rec recruits did. They uh, really, uh, what you did normally as a recruit, you march into the uh, mess hall and you sit down and, and you're fed. But here you sit, you you stand at the table, it was like a picnic table, a long table, and you don't sit down, and then the mess sergeant, after everybody files it, everybody uh, sits down and he tells you, okay, we've got pork chops and mashed potatoes, whatever, there's enough for at least two for each soldier, and there are some extra ones, go to it. And nobody would touch anything until he delivered deliver, deliver the message, and this is what you what you ate, and the food was good. It wasn't slopping into a mess kit, kit that we got regularly. And uh, there were all kinds of interesting experiences. I learned uh, you really don't think for yourself too much in the Army. It was, uh, well, it must have been... The weather was turning, it was getting cool, and we would, the, uh, the a little flu epidemic spread on, on the post, and we were told to, it was a general order, to wear long johns. So you had to wear long johns. 
Well, it so happened I read or heard what the weather was going to be like that day. We were to do some field work and then wind up doing exercise at the end of the day when it was predicted to be a, a warm day. So I didn't put my woolen underwear on. And so while we're doing the exercise, we're going back to camp, to, to the camp, the uh, sergeant said, Soldier, you re, re, where, where's, where was you, why, why weren't you wearing your long johns? And we're marching back. I said, well, I knew it was going to turn hot, and you ordered everybody to take them off. Well, I didn't have any to take off, and uh, everybody has to be in uniform. So he said, put them back on. And then I, so he, and it so happened some officer saw me out of uniform, out of uniform. And I had a report to the captain. And the captain informed me that you get orders to do something, you do it. This is what you have to do. And so I was, I lost a weekend in town and I had to mop the floor in the, in the officer's room room and that was it. So, so, they, so anyway, they would give you, I made it, huh? They'd give you a weekend pass. Yeah, I could forego it. What did you guys do when you go into town? Well, we just walk around. Oh, huh. something I forgot. Thanks. Good good question. We uh, we would get some mo the camp was outside Anniston, Alabama. And that was the town we would go to and uh so the big thing was to get something to drink, and uh, alcohol was illegal, but you can get plenty of moonshine. Moonshine. So I bought a pint. I bought a pint of moonshine. I don't remember what I paid for it, but I was able to get about maybe two or three sips out of it, and an MP grabbed me, and the bottle let me go, and he kept the bottle of moonshine. So that's that was the army way. And uh, so uh, that was life. And uh, eventually I wound up to e in England and then in France. And that was my first really sobering moment. We came in on a small ship that crossed the channel and they had a net. We would disembark, disembark by climbing into the uh, uh, landing craft, which was bobbing back and forth. And we were told, keep going, because as soon as you get on the net, there's a guy in back of you. So you keep going, and we were warned, be careful, make sure you got your foot on the landing craft. So we were waiting for, uh, waiting for, other, for the landing craft to fill up, and one shave tail lieutenant, a second lieutenant, didn't learn his lesson, and he slipped and he went into the water. Whether they ever recovered his body or not, or not I don't know. We were climbing down that rope ladder with about 40 pounds of uh, equipment, and live ammunition, hand grenades, and all. And so we got into an, an area where we were given assignments, and at that time they didn't need any machine gunners. They needed rifles. Rifleman, and so I became a rifleman, and when and went in, as I, they gave me an M1 rifle, rifle, and the way I went, and this was in Normandy. It was a bitter battle, getting fields one one small field by another, and uh, as we were crawling on our bellies, I uh, all of a sudden I felt that something like the guy in back of me was horsing around and jo joyfully uh, tapped my rear end. Well, it turned out he had hit me with the butt of his rifle, but to tell me that I was bleeding. I didn't even know I had been shot. A 30 caliber bullet went through my thigh, miraculously just went in and out, and just tore apart, tore apart, apart the flesh didn't hit any bone and so that was my first airplane ride I was evacuated to England 
and uh, eventually they sewed up the the wound and uh, went back to my out, outfit. And this already was uh, early uh, fall, and we were the co the company was uh, in the bivouac area getting fresh supplies, fresh new shoes, stockings, wool socks, whatever. And uh, we knew that we were going to be shipped out. But it was very pleasant on this farm. We were, we were bivouacked on the farm and talking with my uh, one year of German in high school and, Ye and Yiddish. Uh, I was able to talk with these Luxembourg people. They couldn't believe that we ate maize. Sweet corn at that time was unheard of to, as being edible f for people. All the corn they had was given to the animals. And the uh, woman, the women, young women, the mothers, uh, Bobby, they, uh, the men were all gone. They're, all the kids, all the boys that were 13, 12, 13 years old were picked up by the German army. And uh, then we moved out into the Hurtgen Her Forest. Were the Luxembourgians happy to see you? Was it what? The, the Luxembourgians, the, like the farm that you were on. Were, yeah. they, were they happy to see you? Oh yeah, they were very happy. They uh, helped supplement their food. And, uh, and, you know, in the farm there's always something extra. They were very pleasant. They were glad we were there. And uh, we were assigned to relieve in the 3rd Division out of the Hurtgen Forest just outside of Aachen, in northern Germany. And uh, we were told, be careful when once you get off, once you're deposited, make sure you got cover. Either find a, an existing fox hole or build, make your own. And I was teamed up with a guy that was about six three, six four, Slim Agnew from uh, Texas. And so we had to dig like hell to build a foxhole for, for ourselves. And uh, before we finished, we were, uh, uh, we were the subject of a bombardment. It was getting late in the day, and we had a huge art artillery bombardment. And the danger was not so much from the shells, but they, were, uh, they had some shells that were refi refined, so they would burst on the tree birch. They would explode, just hit a branch, a, a small branch. There were pieces of wood flying all over the place. And we just didn't even finish our foxhole. There wasn't room for our uh, backpacks or blankets, even our rifle. We just jumped in and kept our heads low. The earth shook and trembled, something fierce. And uh, we, uh, well, we got out when it stopped. We looked for our rifles. They were gone. One, we saw one of the rifles wrapped around the, tr around the tree. Well, we managed, and uh, that evening uh, I had to relieve myself. And so what do you do? You just walk away from your foxhole and you squat, take your pants down and squat. And at that time, this was night as I say, the, the, the sky was all lit up. I don't know if it was American or German flares went up lighting the, the, the terrain, something fierce. And so we were told and we, we, we learned the lesson well. We don't move, you just sit there like uh, here at another branch, another little bush. Sure, because they, they look for moving shadows. Yeah. Because those flares will Exactly. Put, and so if you move, they see the movement. If you don't move, they can't see you. So it's, what do you do in a situation like that? The first tendency you want to run, run for cover, which is the worst thing. And there's a uh, southern... southern 
uh, saying, you know, you, uh, What's the, uh, the southern saying? No, the southern saying, yeah. Whether you shit, at that time you, you don't know what the hell to do, to run or to s just keep squatting there. And the army expression came to mind. Didn't know whether to shit or go or go blind. Anyway, I, I just sat there, and, uh, and then the uh, the flares stopped going. So I scrambled for cover, and uh, we were going along and advancing slowly in the for in the forest, and uh, all of a sudden, oh. Slim, my, my, my buddy, he, we had shipped out from Luxembourg as they were replenishing us with supplies. And he had, a, he had gunboats for shoes and he didn't have his size shoes. So they said, well, we'll be back the next day. And they gave him a pair of galoshes and some extra hose to wear, hosiery. And, but we shipped out before his shoes came in. And he was in miserable shape. His feet were terrible. He was wet and f frozen. So he needed, and he had needed help to go back to the aid station. And I went. I, he went along with me. I helped him along. And on our way, somebody else came along, and they had two German soldiers who were captured, and they were. So the guys that were, oh, so we walked, and that's when I really wanted to kill, kill, kill some, some. Oh, I get, I'm running dry. Okay. Take some water. Take some more water, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I guess this is kind of psychological and no, it's getting dry like that. Anyway, I, uh, so we, we were mar mar walking back to the aid station and a couple of, one soldier came up by us and he had two German captured prisoners and he asked us to take them back because he had to go back. So we took these two guys and had them march in front of us. And uh, if ever I felt like killing somebody, this was the time. And we, um, Slim and I argued, should we do it? Should we could take them out of their misery and be too less? But we, our humanity prevailed and we turned them in and we went into the aid station. And this is December of 44, 45, 44. 44. And so I came into the, we came into the aid station and I said, well, you take care of this guy, I'm okay. So they said, all right, why don't you sit down? And it was a warm house and, which was taken over and uh, they told me, take your shoes off, we'll give you some dry stockings. Well, I couldn't put my shoes back on. My feet swelled up. Oh, boy, you lucky guy, you got trench foot. I said, what do you mean, trench foot? That belongs in, in the Pacific. We, we didn't have it. Well, that's what you got. Your feet, your, at one point your feet got wet, and then they froze, and they thawed. And so you were going to go back to, uh, we are going to evacuate you to England. And so I went back to England, had a pleasant stay in the hospital. And when it was all over, we were told, uh, if you were civilians, you would be 4F. That was the classification exempting you from mil military service. And so we, uh, I was reassigned to an Air Force battalion and worked in a uh, pushing papers around 